Today we're going to talk about uh, Sharpsko correction in particular, but it's really more deformity analysis, um, how I approach the Sharpsko foot, as well as various different frame constructs um, for the foot and ankle, and um, you'll get some tips and uh, pearls as well. So this is a title I saw at the uh, one of the uh, Baltimore courts is a chaos. It's computer hexapod assisted orthopedic surgery. So that's what that's what we're doing. This is a patient of mine that has a little uh, road runner that likes to sit by him and look, take care of his frame for him. So see how happy they are in their frames. <laughs> that's that's with the permission of the patient. Anyway, so. The question that we want to think about is how do we get from here to here? Can you dim the light? Just to, it comes up a little better. Yeah, you probably know this. Or here. Or here. There's various ways to uh, fixate the foot after. So the, what we do is a gradual deformity correction, then the infix. So deformity considerations with any foot, you have your core analysis, your apex analysis. But I think that when it comes to the foot, you've got to think beyond cora. Because the foot is not uh, a single bone that's uh, working in one that you're worried about, that has the typical um, deformity <coughs> parameters of rotation, angulation, translation, and, uh, what, and shortening and or lengthening. Um, because the foot acts as a tripod. And when you do a foot correction, if you think of the foot as a long bone, then inevitably one part of the tripod is going to tip over. And that's something that we always have to keep in mind. So you have to take, you have to think beyond core when it comes to the foot. So you do have to think of your angulation, rotation, shortening, and lengthening um, as well to apply it to the foot. And ultimately, you have to think to yourself, why do I want to do a gradual correction in the foot? So just throw out like a simple starter case. When you're looking at the foot, you want to know what the most common, uh, what the or the the most aggressive deformity that you're dealing with, and work through correcting that while realizing that you could be locking other, unlocking other deformities as well. So here you can see a, a navicular that a uh, charco that kind of. The foot dislocated down itself, the navicular is gone, so your cuneiform onto your talus, um, lateral reductus. The patient actually, this patient had a painful foot as well. It wasn't just a, this patient didn't just have sharp with neuropathy, he had, he had pain. So we have to think about our standard measurements of the foot, the mechanical axis of the foot. Also, when you evaluate your hind foot, so here you have a Mary's angle. I'm, I'm a big fan of really addressing the Mary's angle, and that's your first metatarsal patellus, and here's a 22.4 um, degree um, deformity. The norm that's been uh, published by LAM is, is actually six degrees in the other direction, so this is not a 22 degree deformity, it's really become the 28 degree deformity. So that's a lot of deformity, and even if you look carefully at the skin structures on the dorsum, because that's where you're gonna be correcting through, look how it's a little lax over here, the skin's kind of like tightened up on that top portion. So you go correct that in one fell swoop, and you're going to start pulling on the posterior, to, um, excuse me, the dorsalis pedis artery and those skin structures. Um, here is not much of a calcaneal inclination angle, um, but that that uh, heel up in the ear is a typical of an equinus deformity. Um, so the the patient does have an equinus, even though they have a normal calcaneal inclination angle. You don't see that a lot, that equinus that you've been dealing with. Um, in your, uh, uh, like the last, uh, what we did yesterday. This is a giggly saw osteotomy, as we discussed the other day. So you want to make sure when you pass the giggly saw that it's like flush against the bone. Um, that instrumentation that I was talking to you about yesterday really gives you a nice clear path that you can make sure that saw is really nice on the bone. Um, I got some videos, I'll show you how, it's, how the um, giggly saw works. But, so here's your miter frame, so if you're one of the on just at a slow mo, how it functions. So YouTube. So you can get multiple corrections and multiple planes of deformity, and this is what we're trying to do yesterday with the miter frame. Ignore the top part, but this is actually from a cavus foot to a rectus foot. So you can see how you can correct abduction and the cavus at the same time. 
That's what we're trying to attempt with uh, this. Let's see how we do with the next one. Here is the miter frame on with the giggly saw hanging out. I don't wrap up my giggly saw as you saw yesterday. I just kind of let it hang. I don't, I, doesn't have, nothing really happens to me. But you can see that obviously we were trained in the same place, similar techniques over there. Um, I'm always using a double ring construct for the sharp deformities. Um, I typically still like the um, throwing that wire first um, instead of doing the half pin straight down the tibia. Um, but I mean, like Dr. Laporta, Dr. Labe, they're throwing the half pin straight down the tibia. It may save a, a, a few minutes. I, I don't know, I'm just so used to doing it the other way. So when you're doing your miter frame correction, and what you have to realize is the computer's gonna ask, and this is just a review from yesterday, but the computer's gonna ask, the center of the frame of the AP view, is it translated, is there angulation, those kind of things. So we're gonna use the second metatarsal as your point, and that's why you saw in that video yesterday, that pin that was shot up through the second metatarsal. If you shoot that pin up through the second metatarsal and then you fixate it, right through the bolt over there, you know that you don't have any translation. So the less that you're on, the less angulations and translations you have in the frame, the easier it is and you have less problems with the program. However, I am a big proponent of, I, I, I'm, I'm not so thrilled when I hear doctors say you have to put on the frame 100% correctly. Um, that means, you know, with zero angulation, zero translation. You have to put on the frame that's a stable frame, and try not to, you know, convince patients, you know, surgeons, oh, get that frame, you know, at zero degrees in every way. Uh, that's wrong. You need to have a stable frame more important than anything. Secondly, besides a stable frame, and, and a frame that's built with the Lazarov uh, ideals and, you know, like, you know, more wires built away from the frame, that means less stability. You gotta have a really stable frame. The second thing you have to do that overrides these angulations and everything and Alex, you can correct me if you don't uh, like anything that I say at any time. Uh, the second thing you have to do is recognize where you're correcting through. That means if you're gonna make an osteotomy on the talus and put your frame on the metatarsals, don't come crying to me saying, you know, why is it pulling apart the metatarsal cuneiform joints and I'm not getting any correction through the talus? You gotta have those wires right up against where the osteotomy is. So you have to use strong principles of not just worry about, you know, I would not harp on saying, get that frame straight, you know, zero degrees, zero degrees. That's, I think that's wrong. Can I ask a quick question? On the previous slide, just out of my own curiosity, you were using five hole posts? Yes, block? I use a block post around here, yes. Okay, is there a specific thought process on that? You can use anything. I just, it, I find it's more stable than using uh, threaded rods. But you can use threaded rods. You can use well, you, there's any. You can use many kind kind of constructs. Less fiddle factor. Just yeah, this was this slips on really easy, okay. and you're just throwing in the nuts yeah. as opposed to the threaded rods where you ex the bolts. The bolts. Excuse me. As opposed to the threaded rods where you're spinning the nuts. Right. So that they, I just find that it, it's uh, <coughs> the Al Thompson technique. And, All right, so I, I want you, so the, 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 a lot of you guys, you know, you're used to looking at the saw bones, and I mean, so many of you have looked at x-rays as well. I want you to start getting used to seeing, um, measuring it off the foot and the x-rays. So as you can see here, you can measure the foot. Like, I know that, let's say, the segment of parcels here, the reason why I know that is because I was taking an x-ray, I put a wire over there, and I can kind of like, you can make a draw a line on that. But you can see how you're measuring the, with the goniometer, how much medial, and, medial um, tilt four you have over there. Here's it done off the x-ray. So you have, this is the bisection of the foot. This is the bisection of the second metatarsal. Um, you see how much you have translation. This is the center of the ring. So you can measure your translation, your rope, um, of the, and when you're putting in your mounting parameters. Here's how you should look at it in the lateral view. So you're gonna have the center of the ring and the lateral view. Is it translated plantar? Is it translated dorsal? Is it tilted anterior? Is it tilted posterior? These are the things you kind of kind of get into your head on how, also they want to know how far from the osteotomy. So with the new hex thing, you can get much more exact uh, uh, calculation, that's not proper English, 
but uh, you can get a better calculation um, because they did all of those um, formulas of that to know exactly the um, place from the bone when you draw that line. Um, and, and then you're going to have a much better correction um, with less running less residuals. Um, so here we go again. So once again, you have, I can easily measure the frame <coughs> to where the to the, where the osteotomy was. So I know I have an exact amount. As well from here, from the center of the frame to the osteotomy. <coughs> so you know you have to realize that the osteotomy is over here, the osteotomy is over here, and the osteotomy is over here. So you want to know, the question is, where do you measure from? Because this is a much larger distance from here to here, than from here to here, than from here to there. Center, right. So just keep that in mind. You know, these are I mean they, these are questions that may pop up that people are gonna say, hey, wait a minute, I don't know where what's considered the center of the osteotomy. So just keep you know, keep all these things like fresh in your head. So also this was a discussion yesterday, so if you for that for this particular foot, you throw in an osteotome on this, you know, that's a, that's you got less of a foot to deal with to begin with. Now you're gonna open it up, throw in an osteotome. That makes that procedure even less likely to um, work out well. So also, you want to know where, which part of the frame do you want to use? Because what's interesting is, if you look carefully at this, so in the center of the frame, on the lateral side, it becomes different than the center of the frame on the medial side. Because that, that frame doesn't, it doesn't, the, remember the foot is, the foot has a, a, a longitudinal arch and a horizontal arch. and it you know, doesn't always look right. So you want to pick that center of the frame from the medial side. Uh, you can use that first metatarsal as your target. So you, you, the, with the butt frame and also the miter frame, for the foot portion, use a distal reference. Why use a distal reference? Because it's much easier to take all your measurements with a distal reference. That means you can measure that second metatarsal, you can measure that first metatarsal, use a proximal reference, it's very hard to know. Are you in the middle of the calcaneus? Um, what's your axis along the calcaneus? You can get a decent view of a distal reference in a second. So don't let anybody convince you to do a proximal reference. Even though it's correct, you can do a proximal reference. I've yet to see really good x-rays on proximal reference measurements that are convincing that you're getting good, um, you're getting good measurements. So, one, um, here. so now also, very important, rotation, rotation, rotation. At the end, you always check that rotation. Um, so here, that's what Dr. Ablad did yesterday. This is a very minor amount of rotation, but if you shoot that wire up the second metatarsal, you see that it's rotated. Here's that uh, center of the tab, so it's rotated internal. So we're gonna get to this a little bit later, but the, this is a, the, the frame is put on in a 180 degree offset. Um, and there's a reason for that based on how uh, it's constructed. So instead of saying it's two degrees internal, it's basically you're writing it's 180 degrees minus the two degrees of internal. So when you put it in the program, it comes out to 178. External. Is that because you're using the distal ring as a reference segment? <coughs> it's not just because you're using the distal ring. I have to get a miter frame, but. The frame, you have to look at the frame. Um, uh, you have to look at this frame as if it's on a long leg, but upside down and twist it. That's how you have to look at the frame. That means this is not tab one and two. Tab one and two are in the back over here. So you basically, tab one and two start in the back over there and you, it's not your, and your, this is your, and, but it starts off on, it, you started on your um, proximal, on your distal reference frame, and it got, it spun over. If you take a miter frame, and you just twist it over and turn it around, then it looks like it's on a regular leg. Alex, you getting one? I don't know if you kept one, but I just keep it. Alex, I'll be back with one in a second to uh, give you the commercial info break. Yeah, if you have to see the frame, I'll, I'll show it to you. Next. Five and six or uh, imagine this frame is on a tibia yeah. and it got moved down to a foot and rotated around. Yeah, we can just think this is your proximal support, right? 
doesn't matter, you put it this way, but it doesn't matter for a computer. If your proximal support, where your struts one and two should be? Right here. There's nothing here. Because there's nothing here, you have to use any other tap. Now, if you try to use this tap, you can. But if you take a ring, this tap is actually not matching the ring. So if you try to do 60 degrees rotation not so you just wait, just turn everything around. And now your patient front is here, but your frame front is here. So you just took the frame, you didn't physically rotate the frame, you rotated the strut attachment. Absolutely the same. Imagine you did a tibia and you just put the struts on the on the other side. Mm. Yeah, like you could you could do a tibia. You know what I mean? You put the, you can put one and two instead of facing forward. You put them in, you put them on the other side. You just have to tell the program that it's good, that there's an offset. So that that's that's what this is doing. So this is this is actually my patient. I don't do that wire up the top, um, but you can see that. This is where the center of the, the tab is. That's our second one. And then the, uh, the second metatarsal I measured was a little bit external. So it's the opposite. Instead of that internal rotation, so instead of being 178 external, you're going to go like 182 internal. But it doesn't let you do 182 internal, so it's like 2 degrees internal. So here's the original x-ray. And here you can see that we made our osteotomy kind of right through here. And I grew myself out a new navicular, patient's own navicular. So basically we put into the program the abduction, the osteotomy, cut the bone, and grew out this new bone. So once again, look carefully on the right is the old x-ray, the new one's the, uh, the one on the left is with his new bone over there, fully corrected foot. Also corrected Mary's angle on the top. This one I decided to fix with the plate. So I just kind of held open that osteotomy. If you want to know what bone regenerate looks like, this is all new bone over there. It's actually uh, nice to see uh, what the, you know, you don't often get to look at the regenerate for whatever reason. Um, but uh, you know, when you're doing a lengthening, um, you know, like this is what it looks like. It feels and looks like just patients, it feels like bone. And that's kind of what it looks like a little bit down the road uh, before we took out the staples. Actually, update these pictures to the latest one. So that that's just kind of like you know what what you can expect a little bit with the miter. So once again, acute versus gradual. This is what I want to harp on a little bit. Acute correction good for small, medium sized deformities. Better in the femur and the humerus. Why? You have more soft tissue to deal with. I mean, you can take a femur that's bent at 60 degrees and straighten it out. Not worry about a lot of the structures unless it's been sitting that bad for years. Um, you know, you, but. Acute, you know, you, you can not really doing lengthening on where you fix it, where you get it. These are things you have to keep in mind, you know, when you're like discussing with the doctor, like, hey, you know, um, why should I do it? Why should I put on a frame? You know, why am I doing this gradual correction? And these are things you have to realize. The gradual correction, you do a large deformity. That means a 26 degree deformity to me is a large deformity. I don't, I mean, it's uh, from a standpoint that if, if it's off the norm. Um, you know, it works really well in tibia and ankle. Obviously, when you, your soft tissue envelope is not good, um, th these are things you have to uh, keep in mind. So, typical ways when we're doing these uh, gradual corrections, varus to valgus correction, you want to worry about that pull on the posterior tibial nerve. Equinus correction, you're going to have pulls on the nerves as well, both pulls on the posterior structures. Um, you have some tailor joint. You know, if you're doing a acute correction on a U osteotomy. So here's one of the things that you kind of want to think about a little bit is if you're doing um, acute correction is how much stretch am I getting on acute correction? That means when you do a bunion, for example, you're not getting any stretch on any structures. You're, you're really just translating. You know, but when, you, when you're doing uh, a hammer toe, you know, like you're also, you're really actually shortening almost because you're taking out those wedges. So you're not pulling on the skin. Somebody tried to correct the hammer toe, for example, without taking out any wedges, and that, that toe will probably blanch and turn white. And that's why you, know, like, you don't even think about it. That's why you have to shorten. So the question is, is that how do I predict how much, how much lengthening am I going to get if I do it a correction? Or the other question you have to ask is, how much do I need to shorten to get this correction? So there's different ways to do it. Um, this is published in Merzenberg. This is really a, a formula. This is an old, old formula on to figure out the rate of correction 
that means you have to realize is that the deformity is going to correct faster over here than over here than over here. And the skin's like over here. So you have to realize where your rate of correction um, it changes <coughs> different, different lengths um, from the uh, different distances from your apex of your deformity. And these are things that you have to kind of keep in mind. Um, so that's a, the, it's called similar triangles. This is called concentric circles. This is a formula that you can see in uh, Paley and Herzenberg's book as well. Um, when you're trying to figure out rate of correction. Now, this is where you have to be really thankful for the systems that are available today because they're doing all that math for you in the system. But it's good to know the basics of the, form the old formulas that were used so that you, you know, like have an idea of how we got from point A to point B. And also as well, once again, you're going to ask, the doctor's going to ask you, why should I want to do this? Why should I want to pick, you know, gradual correction? And the answer is, if, if you're allowed to say this, is that what formulas are you using to know your rate, of, how, much how much stretch you're going to have, how much correction, how fast you can go on your acute correction uh, with your nerve structures and everything um, that are around that area. Um, and then, if you turn the pages in Paley's book again, and this is really more for long bones, but it does affect the foot a lot. It's not just one angle. So I mean, those, these formulas are really for just a, uh, a, a one plane deformity. Once you start adding rotation to the mix, and then you're looking at words like sine and cosine, and your eyes start to glaze over, you know, like that's, that's really where it gets, you know, very complicated as to, you know, make sure that you're doing what's safe for the patient. And once again, that's where you have to say to yourself is that, um, how am I deciding what to do? So for example, here's a patient that had uh, quite a large Mary's angle deformity. But what's interesting is if you do the law of similar triangles, so like if I draw a triangle, like so here's this one part of the leg of the triangle that needs to be corrected. This is the neck of the tail that needs to be corrected. And I wanna know how much stretch am I gonna get over here? How much stretch am I going to get over here? How much stretch am I going to get over here? And if I did this in acute correction, then I also have to realize I got this whole triangle that I'm dealing with, because I'm going to pull down that calcaneus and pull on all those posterior structures as well. So these numbers add up to a lot of different things, but this is just in one plane. I'm going to be getting, you know, at different points, I'm going to be getting uh, 15 centimeters of stretch, excuse me, 15 millimeters of stretch, 12 and 9 millimeters of stretch as well. Um, and that's just in one plane. And then if you have to, you have to add in to the second plane of the formula that's getting corrected as well, if there's any rotation. And those are things that with the skin that's also been compacted for quite a while, um, that can end up adding up to a lot of stretch, thereby causing the patient uh, damage that can have poor results. Um, so for example, over here, if everything's really just a triangle, you know, or you have the law of uh, similar circles. So if you think about it, you want to know, it's like, What's going to be happening back here if I do an acute correction on this? That means if I have a 143 degree deformity and I need, 50, I need to get to 90 degrees, you know, so how much lengthening am I going to get? So this comes out to like 14 and a half centimeters of lengthening, um, you know, like just, just to get that, that. That's a lot of correction that's going to cause the patient a lot of pain. Therefore, and also you can have skin issues. Therefore, doing it gradually saves you a lot of hassle. So once again, also posterior ankle, stretch. Back to the foot, you do, you got a lot of adduction, and you want to have like that patient. This is, the, this is what that patient was. So it's not just the stretch, but that foot, you know, like if you want to like take that foot out of that position that it was in, it was the abduct, the abducted, missing that bone over there. A, you have the, the plantar nerve area that's going to get a lot of stretch on there. B, and that foot is tight. Like, you think you're gonna just make an osteotomy and open it up, that foot's not gonna give you a lot of give. And then once you open it up, it's gonna rotate on you. Like, it, it's, it's, that, that's not an easy foot. You can, you can open it up and make some osteotomy there, shove in some bone graft, you know, and see what happens. Or you can let the patient's own biology do the work um, through the gradual correction. Um, consider when you're doing the Aquinas releases, um, you may have to do a tarsal uh, Aquinas correction, you may have to do a tarsal tunnel release. So, deformity correction of the foot, very important. Do your core analysis, 
A cane inclination angle, Mary's angle, those are your big ones. Met, de met declination angle, that's at 37 degrees that you see in the formulas. Um, your anterior posterior TC angle, your metaductus. You have to use a goniometer for supination. Um, you have, uh, what's it called? The, there's actually a good apps uh, available called uh, Clinometer and Smart Protractors that allow you to take some of these um, measurements that you can do with an app on your phone. Um, that you can uh, do uh, some range of motion things as well. There's actually some, a bunch of studies that have been coming out in the past few years on using apps for range of, ro range of motion measurements um, and trying to validate is an app as good as a goniometer. I actually have a study going on for a certain range of motion to see if it works as well. So it's just interesting like, you know, how, how you can incorporate these things. I actually, I'll use, um, there's something called Smart Coach, which is an app. Um, that they use it for baseball and then all types of sports where you take a video of the, the kid playing sports and then you can slow it down frame by frame. So I'll do that in my game analysis in the office. I'll have somebody walk and then I can slow it down frame by frame and you can see the person like, you know, frame by frame walking and they do a great evaluation like that. Um, this is a, out of the um, book that's given out in Baltimore course on uh, all your regular angles. Typically with with the sharp code, what you're going to see, see how that lateral mirror's angle is five degrees? I'm sorry, it's at six and four. So that means it's five degrees in cadence. So if you have 10 degree uh, deformity of, of, uh, rock, of mirror's angle, it's really 15 degrees. But you'll notice a lot of times you break the mirror's angle, and what happens is this navicular height drops down. Those are things you're kind of looking out for um, to try to correct. You ever used those machines for gait analysis when you walk them and it shows the pressure points? No, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I should be doing that, but for these, uh, it's not it's not making another thing. I, I like it's the almost irrelevant in circle feet. Yeah, I, I like I just like doing the digital uh, video. So here's another one. It's a little bit different than the one we had before. This is more of a translational <laughs> deformity. You see that whole foot got translated immediately over. Um, so if you look at your mechanical axis that's going through from the second metatarsal head to right here about the lateral aspect of the Taylor head, um, you can see what happens is, is that there, it's supposed to be, if you, it's supposed to be five millimeters lateral from the base of the first metatarsal on the lateral aspect. But over here, instead of being five millimeters, it's 26 millimeters. Um, so there's a lot of translation in that. So like, these are the deformities you're trying to look at. So sometimes you look at an x-ray and you go, eh, it doesn't look that bad. You know, I mean, that kind of thing. You know, you can see that your sharp coat, patient's, uh, patient's navicular is gone. Okay, but you know, whatever. Um, but patient had pain. It's very hard for them to walk. They don't have the proper structure of their foot. So here's what your typical lateral Mary's angle looks like in a sharp coat break. Um, so once you're getting these sharp coat, you know, when you're thinking about like, how do I construct my frame? So you can use your two ring construct like we did yesterday for your equinus. The question that you want to ask is, why am I using a miter versus a butt? I mean, if somebody approaches you and says, hey, I got this case, and I see you got all these nice constructs, you know, what, what should I use? I, do I have to do a butt? Do I do a miter? You know, what, 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 do I do a, you know, a six by six torpedo, four foot, four foot, hind foot? Do I use a low plate? How, how do I decide what to do? And, and the answer is that, you know, in your discussions is, are you doing a four foot and hind foot or four foot hind foot ankle correction, or are you just doing a four foot correction alone that you want to do gradually? The surgeon has to make a decision. Do I want to do a four foot correction alone and, and do a open Achilles tendon lengthening and correct that hind foot just uh, acutely and just do the four foot gradual correction? Or is my Aquinas correction so great that I don't feel comfortable just doing that acute correction and I want to dial it in exactly, maybe I have a little bit too much varus, maybe there's some ankle component that I want to add into it, and that's where you're going to decide which way to go. So the minor frame is really just for your forefoot midfoot correction. That means you have a bad break in the Mary's angle, your calcaneus is okay, not much aquinas, and you're really just trying to re re realign that Mary's angle, any abductus, abductus, and rotation in the forefoot. You mean the butt frame, right? The butt frame, sorry, yes, butt frame. Miter frame, you're going to start doing the double correction, meaning you're correcting the equinus along or some ankle deformity or varus deformity in the hind foot ankle, 
at the same time as the forefoot. And that's where that you're getting into the miter situation where you're gonna have 12 struts. Um, you can also do the low plate. Um, do we have a low plate? No, we use a small okay. ring. So you can use a, a small ring as your low plate. If you want to do a forefoot and hind foot correction but not using the miter construct, um, where the frame is working um, forefoot and hind foot independently, um, but you're building off a plate off the front of the tibia. I'll show you some pictures. But before that, we will now show you the Gigli Sohaski Aria. For all of you guys, I really want to see more pictures of that. Um, because if you want these frames to work well, you know, obviously your osteotomy placed properly, placed, placed safely, um, that will make, make, the, make, it, make your case a lot easier and be uh, best for the patient's outcome. The beauty of the Gigli saw osteotomy as opposed to the open procedure is you can place that Gigli saw almost anywhere. You can get Taylor head, Taylor neck, navicular neoform across the, um, across the, um, excuse me, the lingual cuboid across the neoform. You can put it in very different places. So as we saw yesterday, you got that four incision approach. You're gonna free up plantar. So you're gonna take your, um, whatever type of elevator you use. Um, you're supposed to go put subperiosteal. In the Charcot patient, you're really not feeling much periosteum. You're just gonna feel the bone and slide it across the bone. You take a heavy, a heavy gauge suture attached to the end of the, end of the Ghibli saw. You're using radio, you gotta use x-ray. If somebody's gonna pass a Ghibli saw without using an x-ray, I, I, I pity them. Um, so here's what it looks like with a brown handle just passing it through planner. So you see how you're pulling that through from side to side. So here is your suture connected to the Ghibli saw. You can pull medial over to lateral. You could do this both ways. You don't have to do medial, you could do lateral to medial as well. So here's your going up. So I actually prefer to do this method. Yesterday you saw a method where it was, when you were using the Gigli saw, it was going lateral to medial, meaning that it was going, you're pulling it and cutting it in this direction. I actually like to cut it in that direction. I find that with the Charcot foot, that the medial struck exposed that I can pass it up and over as opposed to, and I won't have to worry about cutting um, like the perineals. I mean, either way, something's going to get cut. Um, but I, I just, it's a, it's a quicker pass instead of getting that top to bottom pass, instead of worrying about getting around the uh, structure. And typically also with the Charcot foot, that foot is a lot of times it's abducted over and there's just a lot of flesh over there and that fifth metatarsal head is almost touching the calcaneus. And it makes it much harder to pass the Ghibli saw that way. Here's how you're pulling on it. So here's how it looks on x-ray. So you have, that's what your osteotomy will look like. Here, that's how it looks when you pull it through in the end. It's almost at the end over there. When you get to the end and you feel it through that last portion of the bone, you stop, clip it off, pull it out through. So here's what an osteotomy, this is what it looks like on a cadaver. So if you pass it properly, all your structures are intact. That's how it looks like in the bone. All your structures intact, several nerve intact, everything looking good, everything there. So if somebody says to you, yeah, that can't be done, here you go. Oh, look at that. This is your Gigli saw osteotomy in action. What I find, you really have to have somebody holding the leg on the other side. And it's also like, the, that bone is tough. Sometimes you can pull it off, you can, you can yank that off of the, uh, of the Gigli saw. But the, you gotta have a lot of counter pressure. That's what it means by getting caught up in there. You see how to get it like a good, until you get it started. What happens when you stop in the middle? It'll, 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 it'll catch on to the bone. Bill, you do these wet as well, correct? Yes, I, I'm not using a turnkey on this. It also helps to cool the saw. I mean, there's yeah. very little heat in the saw anyway, but. 
So here's another, this is a different patient, what it kind of looks like before putting it in. So this is out, once again, really important. You're going to pass this giggly saw osteotomy prior to applying the frame. See, there's no frame on yet. So you're just putting that on first. Um, here's that patient from the last picture. That's the, that's the giggly saw um, prior. And where am I here? This is the giggly saw that's pulled through. Your osteotomy is right here and your wires are really close to the osteotomy. So once again, really important, you're gonna see a lot of times that the, pro the program's gonna say recommending a certain amount of distraction. So you have to realize is that you can't just correct these things without distracting the foot. That's the whole, that's the, the whole concept, is that you know, it's just gonna jam on each other if you just try to make a, 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 a correction. So I like to do three centimeters of correction and back it off. Um, I think Dr. Laporta was telling us the same in, in Baltimore the other year that um, two centimeters is what he does. You gotta overcorrect that table first metatarsal angle. So if they're telling you, you know, like 37 degrees on that uh, on the vent declination, you want to go a little bit extra. Or if you're using your first metatarsal extra the angle, you, you, you want to overcorrect on that. I do weekly X-rays. Always look for the axial rotation. So now for the actual frames. What is this miter frame that we're talking about? So the miter frame is based on a miter joint. Um, it's basically two 45 degree angles that come together to form a corner at 90 degrees. So when you see that miter frame, really just look at the tibial portion, look at the calcaneal portion, look at the foot portion. So imagine, this is the tibia, this is the calcaneus, this is the foot. That's what the miter frame is doing. But it's working two separate areas. That's what your miter joint is. It's like the edge of a picture. So let's see. Here's a patient. This is a classic patient. Charco foot. You can see a lot of equinus, a lot of rocker bottom, four foot, four foot abductus. Um, had a plantar ulcer. If you look really carefully, I sorry I didn't get a big picture of that, but just big, big ulcer on the bottom and small ulcer on the inside. This is what his foot looks like. This is a messed up foot. Okay? You got calcaneal inclination messed up. Mary's angle is 21 degrees. See how the foot is unstacked over here. You got a lot of rope, a lot of supination, 35 degrees of that. So you do a, you do an acute correction on this, I would say you have to cut out this amount of the foot. You'd be left with a half a metatarsal and nothing left in the talus in order to acutely correct that. Besides the fact that that foot, you can't even pull that foot apart. Like you just have to go in and just wedge out half the foot. The guy's gonna have like just a little, he's better off with an amputation in my hand. Um, just, you know, the stump that he's gonna have with the foot's not gonna be much function anyway. So you either amputate it or you do the gradual correction. Here you got the dislocation, tail of uh, the big dislocation. Forget the fact he doesn't have any neoform, so you have a shortening of the foot as well. So here's what a miter frame looks like. See that? That's my, that 45 degree angle joint over there. So, you know, now the miter frame doesn't have to be exactly 90 degrees, but this is what kind of looks like. So this is a cavus to rectus foot correction. So this is not what you're gonna be doing more with. So you can see how it's moving, you see how it's correcting that. You can correct the ankle and the calcaneus and uh, one aspect and you see how the foot's now correcting and the other aspect. Now you, it's gonna be done at the same time, but. So that's what a miter frame and how it's gonna look and what the x-ray we just saw is a typical presentation of so now what we got here is your miter frame attached, it's got your double ring construct. This is going to work on the hind foot portion, this is going to work on the forefoot portion. This patient I decided to put it back and some graft on that uh, plantar ulcer. I, he was, he was suspicion for osteomyelitis, I put in some antibiotics and cement beads. Run the program, here we go, that, uh, that the foot looks. What's interesting is that you're going to, I want you to notice over here that you, you do the correction and what it does is it unlocks these deformities. So a lot of times people like they do these acute corrections and they don't realize they unlock the <coughs> deformity. So you're gonna look at this foot a little bit later and see that we got the foot beautifully corrected except it unlocked the deformity. And if you do that acutely, you can't go back in and fix it. You could go back in and fix it, but if you did it gradually, you can just rerun another program. So um, we were talking about the other day divergent half pins. Don't put those half pins straight up and down. This is one that's straight up and down. I don't mind that one because it's in between the block. But these proximal ones, they gotta be divergent um, or else you, you run the risk of fracturing the tibia. Um, here's that the cement beads, you can pull it out after two weeks. That's one month in the frame, wound is gone. 
here is post correction. Okay, so remember what I looked like originally? Do you want to go back and see it again? All right, if not, sure. Before. After. Overcorrect between everything. 3.4 degrees. Got my Kekan inclination on it. It's usually a little bit higher than we wanted. It's something that usually goes into a little bit of caves, but it drops back down because I'm not fixating the subtalar joint. So I, I find that that works out well with the, the 31 degrees, even though it's a little bit more than what you want. And also the measurements are sometimes off on these um, x rays. Here we got to make sure to realign that payload first metatarsal angle in the AP and in the lateral. If you're going to throw a beating screw across there, you got to have that fully aligned. So when you're looking at these x rays, you know, and you're saying, like, oh, are we ready to take off the frame? You got to say, well, wait a minute, how do, you, how do you want to fixate this? You want to put a beam in there? You want to put a plate on it? You want to put a beam in there percutaneously. You got to have this perfectly aligned, or else your beam's going to miss. This is what happened after the corrections. You see all that beautiful correction, and this is what it did. It unlocked this deformity. So basically, after the correction, I got everything aligned, but he had a lot of supination left over. So I ran a residual. A week later, happy with everything. So this is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a work, you know, and, but it's, it could be done, works well. This is like two and a half months in the frame. Um, one of the things that you, if you're using these frames, um, uh, there was the uh, eraser technique, which I like. You want to use uh, zip ties also. So you're going to have to go to the store, buy yourself a bunch of zip ties. There is a lot of pressure on these, on these rings. Okay, I've got, I have patients that have bent, bent um, rods and popped out plenty of rods because of the amount of force to pull apart a foot. It, it's, it's, you have no, it's, it's probably over 3,000 pounds of force pulling that foot apart. And Alex, was, haven't you made some changes to the, the uh, locking screws now? Yeah, the, I don't know where is they, how they rolled out. Yep. So you still can probably find the old. There's probably a few of them out there, but most of the nipples on all the all the struts that you guys receive when you get your struts back there in those plastic tubes, yeah. that was a differentiator from SRL. So we probably have a few of them out there, and then we may have a couple 160 double row foot plates that uh, those new struts may not go in. So uh, they'll go in, but they may not. They may not lock. Yeah. yeah. So from uh, from we should get that internal purposes, we've been trying to no. pull every one of those. As There's far as I'm aware, for the last six months, we don't have any reports about strut popping. No. no. Strut so, popping out? Yeah. 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 No. So there was, a, there was a little bit of clearance issue with each uh, SRL, for, you know, kind of done. So, but they resolved this issue and it shouldn't be there. Now, for those of you who had them with the surgeons, I'll just suggest before going to surgery, just check this. Your, is it that part number or another part number? Just just to be sure you can replace it if, if necessary. But it should be resolved, at least I haven't heard any problems. So here for post residual. Is that wound that was originally there? So here's the frame wall. This is what you if you want to beam this, you gotta have this aligned. First met, first metatarsal talus, first metatarsal talus. I'm sure you guys know how to take out frames. People are undoing the whole frame. The, the, the easy ways to do it just from asking, but you can just pull it off with one piece. So then some people are saying they're taking it apart piece by piece. You know, it should take like 40 seconds to take this off. So here's the um, passing the beaming wire. Here's my beaming screw. Got nice right down the middle. Add some to the other, triangulate. Got a little something going on over there. So that's one. Okay, so next. Here is a, this, it's hard to uh, kind of think about, but I wanted, this is a good review for yesterday. We were talking about Equinus yesterday. So first of all, I had to show you a norm because it, it doesn't sometimes make sense over here. But remember, this is your normal calcaneal inclination angle. So that's about, norm is 18 to 24 degrees. Let's say this is 20 degrees, okay? You see how this is the opposite direction? Okay, so that, just imagine over here, your Achilles kind of pulling up on this. This is going in the opposite direction. So the, the magnitude of deformity here 
is at the norm is 20. This is about a, a what's it called? This is a, a 39 to 40 degree deformity. Now, remember how we were also talking this apex anterior. So remember, because the computer doesn't care about my 40 degree deformity over here. It wants to know what my apex anterior is from this. So I actually use the calcaneus. I didn't use the talus on here because if you look carefully, there's no deformity really in the calcaneus, in the talus portion. The talus is great with the marys. That's all good. It's really all calcaneus. So I'm making my, my apex off of the body of the calcaneus like this. And this is what we mean by this. This is what we're going to measure that apex anterior over there. So basically, this is an equinus frame. But what I have to do is I have to lock up the midfoot to the device so that I'm only working on the hind foot. Does that make sense? Because if I just put this on as the equinus frame, the whole foot's going to go up, and I didn't want to do that. I needed this bone working independently from everything else. So I locked all this up together, and then this is where the work was being done. So you see over here, that's where I had this discussion with Dr. Lalag yesterday. This is like a classic case where I'm going to use a half pin in the heel um, for that amount of correction that I need. Um, so that's going to kind of really just kind of um, guide that down. Um, I, will, I, I will not do this approach again in the sense because I will be, um, Dr. Uh, Alex over there um, showed us that there's actually better ways to um, coming in from the side instead of straight in from the back and you can get rotation on that. Um, so, uh, but I definitely would suggest in these kind of big equinus cases on an adult, um, divergent half pins coming in from the two sides um, that are back over there. But you see over here is that this is doing really nothing. This is just getting locked up to the top over here. Um, so this is one unit. This is where the work is getting done. So you can see. All right, slow down. What? So basically, remember, I have to take the forefoot and independently and lock it up to the tibia so that all the work is getting done in the talus. And then two, so I got here, there's two hex struts going up to the tibia, they're not getting programmed. Right. Anything from this ring going to the tibia is not getting programmed. I think there's even like a threaded rod that's curved or a So that's just a third point fixation. You know, there's nothing, you got a universal and a rod. Can I suggest something? Can you go back to the first one? Uh, yeah. It's good if your surgeon has experience. If not, what you can actually suggest a little bit simpler, just use the same butt construct, but put your foot support, foot plate this way. So you have the foot plate here, connected to the foot plate here, and then run from here. Then you can run in not the clients, but you are running the butt frame. Correct. Opposite way. So it's another way to do it. And that's, that's also, that's instead of the miter, you can also, let's say you don't want to do a, I, I happen to think, the miter is pretty easy, but some people are really comfortable with butts. You could do a butt with a ring in the front and a ring in the back. That means that, that's what he's kind of saying is that this is basically creating, you can create a butt and just put your ring in the back of the butt and, and pull it down like that. So that, that's just an alternative. So, a question on your x-ray. It looks like your anterior process of your calf is fractured. Yeah, it's like a, it was a Charcot fracture. Yeah. You can get Charcot. Or this is a, this is, you, 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 if you ever read in these, um, there's a lot of, uh, been published over the years, different types of Charcot's, like trying to define Charcot. And you see it always says like, you know, 50% of Charcot is midfoot, and then you have this percentage that's calcaneous. Yeah, so this, this is usually this, worse prognosis, this one. Right, so this is one of these calcaneal Charcot's. So it's kind of like um, fractured, didn't one. feel anything, getting this wound on the bottom, got sent to me really fast. You know, I mean, she's on dialysis. She's doing great. I mean, she is happy, happy as can be. Um, so, is there a chance when you're driving the rear of the calf back down that because of the fracture, you you end up separating the subtalar joint posteriorly? The chance for anything, but this is what it looked like coming off. <clears throat> It didn't separate, it separated a little bit. You right. can actually see a separation. Right. So my technique when I do this, and, and it seems like less people, most people like to do the open TAL. I will percutaneously nick the TAL in like four or five different spots, put on the frame, 
and let the t and let the Achilles kind of stretch on itself. Um, that, that's what I, I do. I don't, I don't like to make any real incisions over there. I, I, most of my stuff is... Now, again, imagine the majority of sharp cases, you're not going for anatomic reduction. Mm -hmm. You're right. going for nice, right. you know, yeah. traceable, yeah. you know, right. great right. food. So. Because you don't have the lever arm or the anterior portion of the cap, I just wonder if it will just pass your reduction of it and just keep on going. Look, anything could happen. I mean, you know, like, I, I, it worked out well. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, you know, I, and I was concerned before I had to do the case, I told the patient, like, hey, this may not work, I may have to go and do, like, a posterior ankle release, you know, but there's, like, a lot of, you know, contracture over there. Nope. Now, let's talk about how to build this miter frame. I want to show you a step-by-step, -step, because I think we're going to be getting into building the miter frame soon, and so I just want to see on the picture so that you can kind of see, so here's that guy from way down before, you had that big deformity, so also, not, no, not, this is not for acute correction, but this needs a correction in two, two planes. I need, my, I need the forefoot portion and the hind foot portion to be corrected in a gradual fashion. This can't be done in one step. So I got a 52 degrees mirror angle, and the normal is a plus six, so which makes it a 58 degree deformity. It's a big deformity. Also, it's interesting, if you look at the x-rays, I'm just gonna stand in front of this one, this was his x-ray. Looks like a regular AP. But if you just take the talus and you just straighten it out, you can really see how much, um, what's it called, ad adduction that he has. There's the foot. Now he also had a lot of uh, external rotation in the leg as well. When you use your patella forward technique, pass the giggly saw. So place your proximal ring orthogonal, add on your, um, your second portion. <laughs> this is a, an interesting technique that I was taught uh, that, that I, I kind of like in this, is you can place that ring distally and not throw in any wires. This really works well sometimes if you're trying to figure out you know, where you want to go. Place your ring, lock down everything, get your position. Because even if you have residents in the room, I'm working with two residents and stuff like that, they don't always know where I want it to be, but you could put on that ring, you do this with the butt frame as well. You put on your butt, you put on the butt thing, lock down that foot plate, you know, put on your wires, connect the whole Connect the whole thing. Don't put any wires in. Now you can start throwing in your wires when you're happy with the position. That's not going to move on you because you locked it all down. It's real. You'll see. Try it out yourself when you when you're building your own butt frame. Yeah. Now him also a lot of equinus. I got that uh, posterior uh, big screw, the big uh, big rod in there. Um, now, whoops. Then I place in the foot portion. So you can see here, you got your miter, so you got your foot. This, the calcane is placed at a 45 degree angle, and then you got your leg. So then you got to start taking measurements for two aspects. Okay, so you're running two separate programs. You're going to be running, the first program is going to be like your equinus program. So just like yesterday, you're going to tell, you have a proximal reference point, just like your equinus, you know, center of the ring, is it medial, lateral to the tibia? Is it anterior, posterior, tilted, medial, lateral, tilted, all that? How far is it away from the apex of the deformity? Use your ankle or your subtalar joint. Just like, it's going to be just like your equinus correction. However, when you put in your strut amounts, the computer is going to recognize that this is tilted at 45 degrees. So don't worry that this is tilted at 45 degrees. The computer knows that once you put in the strut amounts. When you tell the computer, all this properly, and especially with the hex, it's going to even look better. You know, and you say that it's this amount of distance, I use the subtalar joint, it's going to know based on the strut amounts that you're tilted. You know, the doctor sometimes like, how does it know that it's tilted? Once you put in those struts, the computer realizes that, hey, that thing is tilted, and, 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 and adjusts for that. Okay? That's your equinus correction. Here also, my frames, I run a little tight, use the emergency tab. It works well. Have a bunch of them available if you're doing miters and butts. 
any footprint, yes. How do you change the computer program when you're using an emergency tab? Oh, that's a fantastic question. So, based on a small study that's being done, it seems like there's really, what is it, no, there's no angulation or? No angulation, just translation. There's Lexin. a small translation um, when you have an emergency tab. Um, and we're talking very, very small, but there's no angulation or, um, so the computer doesn't need to know that there's an emergency tab there. It's none of its business. So just plug it's, it, you, just pl you just put on the emergency tab, and the, there's nothing in the computer that says you have an emergency tab there. And, and no, the, the computer doesn't ask you that, and there's yeah. nothing there. And yeah. strut legs don't really change. Your it, settings don't really change. It's, it's not. It's not that strut legs don't change. It's that your deformity correction is not affected much by an emergency tab. That's why it's called emergency tab. It would in a case of emergency. The only what you can see in the software, software can you give the warning that whatever construct you're using is physically impossible. Yes. Do so you want I've to continue? That. And you say yes, I'm continuing without you know. Yeah, if, you, if you use emergency mm -hmm. tabs, you may get that warning. Yeah. But you continue as it's no emergency tab in the software. Yeah. I use the emergency tab in this case not because of this strut, it was this strut. This strut was hitting against the ring over there. And I'll show you some other examples so you can know when to use the emergency tab. So here now, you're running that second program on the miter. Okay? So the second program on the miter is going to be the, for, the foot portion. So we had that gig we saw that we passed. So we need to know lateral, is it dorsal, plantar, anterior tilted, posterior tilted, how far from the osteotomy. These are things you should get in your head. That's, once you got that, this is, a, this is nothing. Okay, here's the same thing. This is like that miter frame um, that you have to, it's, except, it's like a miter frame construct except you don't have the foot plate in the back. Okay, internal rotation, external rotation, you know, uh, what's it called? Um, how far from the osteotomy, uh, medial tilt, anterior tilt, posterior tilt. So here we can see, and this is a great example so you can see what it means. Um, by raise of hands, is this translated medially or laterally? Medially, anybody? Is it translated laterally? Anybody? All right, nobody wants to guess. It's medium. It's medium. So that's, that's you have to, this is easy to do. Once you look down that frame, you gotta just look down the frame properly. So when the surgeon is like, how do we know if it's medium? Like, you, you just gotta stick their head on top of it. You know, that, these pictures can help you like see like, you know, the, basically where it is. This is great also because that, that's what I'm saying is that, you know, you hear these docs that say, you gotta build it perfectly. No, build it to, that it's stable and you get the osteotomy to work. This is what made it more stable. Now, it happens to be, it's tilted medially forward, you know, by X amount of degrees, and we put that in the program. The computer will adjust for that. Um, next, distance from the frame to the osteotomy site. So, you know, obviously you want to measure it on x-ray for exact measures, but you can do it in the operating room because I know my osteotomy came out right over here. So I can just take the frame and just put a ruler from there to there, and I'll be on by you know, a couple of millimeters. So I, I use the hex, you know, but you know the hex may be tough on the foot because you can see there's a lot of overlap of things. So you still like until we get that really down pat, um, get your measurements good. Um, here is getting through the correction. So we had that 50 degrees up to there, and now so here's where we started. Here's that, you see that distraction, you see that all pulled apart? So you see that first metatarsal is now aligned with the talus. Um, we still have, so we got that hind foot correction, we still got that forefoot correction, that's still like, that's, that's taking a while over there. And now here we have, that's your, that's your beginning, and there's your end, so you got that nice alignment over there. Get myself a nice calcaneal inclination. That you did not do a rear foot osteotomy, you're just dragging it. No, up. that's bad. Yeah, I'm just using, I, that's what I'm saying. I just nick the Achilles and just pull that thing down. You know, and, and you may say, like, that's a lot, of, that's a lot of force, but you can see your, my calcaneus is intact. I pull out that half pin earlier in the game once I get my correction. Um, but even that, like I said, I'm switching over to these divergent half pins, see if I can leave them a little longer. Um, but, um, you know, that's kind of the deal over there. You, you, you can do it with an osteotomy. In my hands, with and my usage of the, the, the hexapod systems and any of them, I, I don't need to do any hindfoot osteotomies. There's, if you think about it, 
and you can argue with me if you want, there's really no bony deformity in the hind foot. I mean, we're not talking about ankle, we're talking about talus and subtalar, the subtalar joint calcaneus. Everything's soft tissue contracture, and you can really correct all that soft tissue contracture with Texafod. The question is how you fixate it afterwards is a different story. I mean, do you have to go in there and do subtalar joint fusion? Uh, and whatever, but it, you know, you, it, you can correct everything with, so, with, with the hexapod. You don't really need to do osteotomies. We're talking in these sharp foot, very different than flat foot. Flexible flat foot and the, that kind of stuff is a whole different story. Um, but, but we're talking about equinus to rectus, varus to rectus. That stuff really doesn't need much of an osteotomy. So you just correct into a calc axial until you see what you like? Yes. It's interesting, I'm just thinking, Paley. Um, he, he, well, he didn't publish it, but he, he was very adamant also like with like Charcot Marie Tooth. There's no bony deformity. It all requires just like soft tissue releases. Like he only does soft tissue releases and, and you know, for, for these kind of corrections. So you have to start to say to yourself is that where's the deformity? Can I get away with, you know, just soft tissue management versus cutting bones? Uh, you know, sometimes cutting bones is better, but not always. So you have to make, that's where the surgeon has to make that decision. Um, but, you know, that's kind of what I get. So this is like your before and after. Um, here's plates with beam screws. This one, if you look carefully, I can be very self-critical. You know, it's not it's not really perfect, but it's good. It's good enough in the sense that it's much better than where it started for a much more walkable foot. Here you got that left and before, right and after. Obviously, there's still a lot of soft tissue swelling, um, but getting there. So let's look at another one. Here we got the, this that typical plantar cuboid ulcer. Um, 15 degree Marys. Look at this offset, your calcane, you got that equinus going up over here, got your cuboid that's down on the ground. See, you, got, you have your adductus and your, your lack of alignment with the, you know, with, you that Z-shaped foot. So here's also another one of these miter frames, okay? Got my hind foot correcting separately from my forefoot, okay? And if you look carefully, this is where we're gonna have the problem, right here, this, this, this row over here. These guys really got close. I um, mean, I had to get those wires really close to it. So to show you some technique on this as well, um, here's how the miter is going to look in the end. So what happened was is that there has to be a rotational component to this because of the deformity. So while we're rotating, the strut was hitting against here and bending against this, and she couldn't do any turns. So what do we do? So in the clinic, basically we take off Take off the hinge, I mean, excuse me, the cube, advance it, Russian technique it to retension it. So if you have to move at something in the in the clinic, just tell the doc, hey, don't be afraid to take it off. You know, just Russian technique it if you don't have a tensioner. Because uh, the tension, just, just make sure you leave, leave this component still a fash. I think that was before the emergency pass came. Um, it, we, even if it wasn't, this was something that we didn't predict because of the rotation that it was going to bump in. Um, yes, I could have just put on an emergency tab as well. It, it, yeah, so the, we didn't think of that. And it wasn't out yet. So here's that correction in the end. You see how that cuboid is now nice and up in the air? I didn't start any zip ties like anywhere on the I see screen. one over there in the top corner. They're clear. And oh, they're clear. Um, yeah. And with so many other frames, you had them all the way around. Is there a reason, like, did you have an experience or something that kind of led to um, Some of them, uh, we just kind of predicted it quicker, or some of them just got lazy. I mean, they, you know, it's not, not, they don't always pop off, but, you know, if it pops off, like, I can even come to go to the store and just tell you that. You don't have to, you can be proactive or you can not. I mean, most of the time you don't need it. In the foot, you need it more because of the rotation and translation and angulation and in the tight area. They're under a lot of pressure, these things. It's very different than a tibia and a femur. We're just kind of pulling, you know, in a little bit of twist. The, the other thing was, uh, like, he had a couple of pop-offs early on, and the patient comes back, and the struts are dangling. But then we went to the covered ones because he's running two programs, so it made it easy, like, to get a resin and do the program. I don't know which ones there is. It's a little confusing for them, the 12 struts. Yeah, the, 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 the 12 struts that you have to really be um, I didn't forget you there, but I think like I, I put tags on it. Um, where is this? Ankle. Yeah, you see like the little tag over there that says ankle correction and the 
one for the foot that I had, they said foot correction. Um, I don't know where it is now. Go ahead. I have a question. You don't want to y'all, y'all ever go in the small incision and kind of plant off that keyboard most of the time the culprit? You, you can, and there's, there is data that says which one to do, but you can plant off that keyboard and they're still walking on it and it still can it continue to stub blood. But it, you, it, it does help sometimes to plant it off, but it's better to get to get the correction and get the foot functioning um, more right. properly. Well, yeah, that too, but just to kind of get yourself in front of the eight ball a little bit. Yes, I do back. recommend that. Um, having done a lot of these, um, and I've heard this from other Charcot lecturers as well, is that they get these beautiful corrections and they're still looking at a cuboid that's sticking down yeah. there. Yeah. So that is something to kind of throw out to the physician that yeah, you know, hey, you know, like you know, just because you got a correction, that cuboid is, is once that once that got, that cuboid got ejected, right? Um, just manually put it back up there and 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 yeah, You're not going to get it back in. Well, right. yeah, it's not right. But you know, the problem that what sometimes what I find is when you're correcting that Mary's angle, and you get that tripod. This is all about realigning the tripod. Once you get that tripod portion of the first metatarsal and the calcaneus, that cuboid goes back. It's up again. It's that collapse of that medial arch from the Charcot um, puts that pressure on the cuboid. If you bring it back up, the cuboid goes up with it. It's not 100% of the time needed. Do you throw stuff down screw to triangulate it every time? No. No, but that's really, that's ultimately surgeon preference on what he's doing once he takes it off. Um, it, it's, it, and some people like, do, do you do some tail fusions on when you finish on these? Most of the time, no. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, and I find that just um, fixating that medial column. If it's that extreme, I rot them when I take it off. I mean, uh, but not necessarily from a fusion standpoint, from a triangulation standpoint, to lock your rear foot in with your forefoot. So what I'm, the way I'm locking it is, first met through. You'll see in this patient, it's, it's going to be first met through the tails, and then fourth met into the into the calcaneus. So that's my, and once I create two um, parts of the, <coughs> a triangle, that subtalar joint's not really moving. Well, you only have one screw. Well, you'll see there, exactly. so you still have a bare assertion. Right, you and you can't that. have that. You can't end up with that, but that's where you can you look, look at your miter frame at the end before you take it off. Right. Now, sometimes you take it off. In this particular patient, took off the miter frame, everything looked good, and three months later started rolling into varus. So right now she's walking on it, but I probably, uh, since she has the screws in there already, you'll see, I'm probably gonna take her back and do a calcaneal osteotomy um, because it's, it's now it's in a fixed position. Um, you see how much pressure there is, how you can bend the rod. This is just from the, this is, there's nothing impinging. This is just from plate to plate with the bend. She snapped you that go, Can you go back? You can tell Al we have extended nuts yeah. when you have the back. Right. Right. Oh, we've already been pointing Four out. Four bolts on top of each other. How'd you even tighten this? How does that even work? Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Yeah. Ryan Callrock's answer to it. God, that's bush league. Selling some stuff. <laughs> well, you know, he doesn't, as I'm putting it on, you know, it's been, only until the end. He's like, from the inside out. He's, like right he's like, wait a minute, I could have sold him that, but. So, anyways, um, here's your correction at the end. You got that realignment, you got that, got that, everything back up, two boy back up in the air. Um, here, I got lazy, did not end up getting the full translation portion in. Um, so, basically, I ran a retrograde from the back of the talus. Going into the second metatarsal, you'll see it in a second. So I got, and that's my triangle that I got going. So I don't need that screw over here. So if you look carefully at the AP, this one's coming from the back of the talus down to the second. This one's coming up the first into the cuneiform, and then this one's going into the calcaneus. So that's that's that triangulation. Go ahead. Ooh, we've got two of them. You go. Yeah. So, so do you have a home health nurse just go in and? Adjust all these patients' struts. So some of the patients are excited to do it themselves, or their husbands are excited to do it for their wives, for for various reasons that maybe they're trying to get back and they're unfortunate. Um, but and, and the one, the ones, and, and the ones that are what's it called? Don't feel confident in doing it for whatever reason. I'll I'll arrange with a, a home nursing program that the nurse will go in and, and do the turns. And, and and it works out really well. Home nursing. They're, they're happy to do it as long as they're trained. The first time that uh, they, they came in, they were nervous, and I was like, 
I explain to them what to do, and you guys can work with them. I think Al, you, you worked with some of them just to kind of tell them what to do. Um, you keep open lines of communication. You know, you just have to train them like anything. The same way you have to train, you know, the patient. You got to train the home nurse if you want to depend on the home nurse. And it's, it's it's easy. They'll they'll everybody's happy that way. We're, we're about starting exchanges. Do you have the patients come back to the office for that, or do you have the home nurse? Typically, no. I have that can go back to the office. Yeah. So since we've determined that the rear foot is all soft tissue, you say you fuse the subtalar joint once you get it corrected. What does that? What I don't fuse it. Okay. I don't fuse it. Okay. And, and Dr. Lott doesn't need to fuse it. And you see I didn't fuse it here. I wonder what that would hold if it's a soft tissue. That's a bony. Well, because what happened is like in this particular case, the patient started going back into varus. And if I would have done a subtalar fusion right. into valgus, it wouldn't have gone back in. Would it have taken the ankle with it, though? I don't know. They, you, know you never know with any of this stuff. <laughs> Uh, you know that that surgeon that surgeon you know that's really where the surgeon has to you know you know just commit you know what, what he wants to do and, and look at the decision you know I mean, you win some you lose some on these I mean they're they're not these are not bunions you know they're not predictable like I mean in a sense like look you do full correction and then you go back to 35 degrees of supination I mean does that make sense you know I mean it, it, you, you can have the real smart biomechanic guys can explain you know. How one unlocks the other and unlocks the other, but a lot of that doesn't even it doesn't even end up adding up. Are you happy with those beams, those right beams? I am pretty happy with them. You know, I mean, the uh, Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, and Dr. Grant, he, you know, he constantly lectures saying the cannulated screw is just as strong and the stainless steel is stronger than right. the uh, than the titanium and. That looks a little friendlier than the giant headed screw. Right. So I mean, I I, I like it. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, I, these are friendly until you try to take them out. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely miserable to get out because the threads on the distal portions of them mm -hmm. are not reverse threaded and they're the same size as the cannulation. And when the shark rope bone mushes around it, I mean, it is you literally bang them out because you you put a tamp against them and you bang them out the back of the calc, out the back of the tail. Mm -hmm. They're horrible to take right. them out. So good to know. Pray that you never mm -hmm. have to take them out. My mine don't. Um, I typically they back out themselves before I have to take them out. Mm -hmm. So that's something to that to keep in mind. I have I should have a picture. Of, a patient sent me a picture of pulling it out in his own house. But that was the old. Actually, that was the Cynthia one. Um, the, just one more review on the, the, so once again with the butt frame, it's so important, like get, get this in your head. Butt frame, just four foot correction, and here's this patient that uh, um, not much of a four foot deformity, it's, it's there, it means basically 25 degrees of deformity, um, you got that big translation going on over there, simple butt. Um, this is not doing anything, this is really because I wanted to, I, my double, she had a, um, the, the calf got really big, um, from the proximal ring, so I just added on a larger ring over it, and the, the struts are there kind of holding. Here's passing the gigging sole once again. Um, here's how we can build uh, speeds on the back. So you can use a, what's it called, a, a two thirds ring, and uh, you know, hook it up, and arch. arch, excuse me, and hook it up, and now this is actually you can take a this is actually not super super stable, but what you can do is to make it stabler is you can take two walking plates and attach them to each other. So if you have any walking plates, you can actually just take two and you can make four walking plates all together. Extremely stable friendly. Yeah. <laughs> if you take the two walking plates, put a threaded rod through it, they trade the frame in for a femur. <laughs> I, I promised you tips and pearls. If you take two walking plates, put a threaded rod through it, it gives you a much better support. So it, it, it's like this patient, you know, she felt she felt good, but it, it wasn't so stable. And um, oh, so you're, so you're saying uh, not attach the second rocker rail to the frame, you're just attaching it to the rocker rail? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Just attaching those two together. Yeah. Put a mash in between them, essentially. Yeah, bring a snowboard. Hey, Phil. Yeah. Are you running the proximal program to correct equinus? There's, no, there's no proximal program then. That was just, I, 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 I double, I double, um, 
I doubled it up, and her calf got really fat, like right above that one, and I couldn't get two of the same size. If you notice my other ones, they're stacked on top of each other, two of the same size with five fold posts. I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's a sailor friendly frame. <laughs> he has a lot of things, but there's time in the operating room, and I felt it was a little quicker to snap than to. Um, wow. I argued with him for like 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 I was like, I said, anything else to attach this with. That's the correction. Just to kind of get you out of it. Just also keep in mind frame over rod. So there's a, what's it called? This is an orthofix rod. Sharp to ankle. It's just an acute correction. You don't need to do a gradual correction on this. Um, basically, just open it up, tie a nail, put the frame on top of it. Um, and then there you go. So yeah, this one is not the same. Static expression. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> that is. Any questions? Okay. Very